Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Carol Cropper, the uh, president of the Royal Economic Society, and I'm delighted to be welcoming you to the 2021 annual public lecture of the Royal Economic Society being run in conjunction with the University of Reading and the University of York. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. So um, I in, I've got a few preambles before I introduce this year's absolutely distinguished speaker, Diane Coyle, who we're thrilled to have. Uh, but before that, uh, you'll have seen as we waited for the start of this talk that the RES has a code of conduct to promote a healthy profession. Uh, you'll have seen that slide, so please do abide by the code of conduct and follow it. And then I'd like to announce uh, also, or draw your attention to um, this year's essay competition, the Young Economist of the Year competition that we run every year at the Royal Economic Society in conjunction with the Financial Times. Um, the 2021 competition is open to all year 12 and year 13 students and the equivalent uh, categories in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, it's not, you don't have to be studying economics to enter the competition and you don't have to be a member of the RES. So everybody is welcome to join the competition. The competition has a number of questions. You can find those on the RES website. And the closing date is on the uh, 25th of July. So you, if you are inspired by economics and you're inspired by those questions, I strongly encourage you to enter the competition. You only have to write a thousand words. And if you win, you will have a chance of having your essay published in the Financial Times. Uh, so the website for that link, the link for that competition is going to be posted on the chat function. So you'll be able to on the Q&A as well. So you'll be able to find it. Uh, let me just remind you of a few. Uh, the format is Diane's lecture will be followed by a Q&A. So I really encourage you to add questions at any time that you want during her talk into the Q&A function. And at the end of Diane's talk, I will then relay those Q&As to her. Um, so I think before, uh, I think that's all the preliminaries. I hope your uh, virtual systems are working well. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce this year's RES annual public lecture speaker, Professor Diane Coyle. Diane Coyle is uh, co-directs the Institute, um, the Bennett Institute at Cambridge. Um, and she herself is the Bennett Professor of Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. As I say, she co-directs the Bennett Institute where she heads research under the themes of progress and productivity. And she's been a government advisor on economic policy throughout the COVID-19 epidemic. Her latest book, uh, Markets, State and People, Economics for Public Policy, examines how societies reach decisions about the use and allocation of economic resources. Um, she's also uh, got a number of other very prestigious posts. She's director of the Productivity Institute, a fellow of the Office of National Stats, an expert advisor to the National Infrastructure Commission, and a senior member of the ESR Council. And she's served as the vice chair of the BBC Trust, a member of the Competition Commission, the Migratory Ad Advisory Committee, and the Natural Capital Committee. She was Professor of Economics at the University of Manchester before she went to Cambridge, and she was um, awarded a CBE for her contribution to the public understanding of economics in 2018. Let me say that I personally have been incredibly influenced by Diane throughout a lot of my career, and it's an absolute pleasure to invite her uh, to be giving this talk. Um, before Diane starts her talk, 
she has posed um, a question to you in the audience that she'd really like you to be thinking about whilst you listen to her talk. Um, her talk is on why is digital so disruptive and what she'd like you to be thinking about, and please post your questions related to this on the Q&A, as to what you think the most significant policy issues caused by increasing digital markets are. So Diane set you some homework whilst you're listening to her. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Diane Coyle. Hello, my name is Diane Coyle. I'm a Professor of Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. And it's a pleasure to be giving this virtual Rural Economic Society public lecture. This title is Why is Digital Disruptive? Economies change a lot over time. We have seen over the centuries the shift from agriculture to manufacturing to services, and they're generally disruptive. After all, we talk about the Industrial Revolution, which sounds quite disruptive. So I'm today going to talk about my research on digital technology and how that's affecting the economy. The origins of digital technology date back many decades or even centuries actually. You can see the origins of uh, digital technology in the work of Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace who had the idea of programming a computer to do complex calculations although the technology they had to build it was very mechanical. Another giant step forward came with Alan Turing and the code breakers at Bletchley Park during the Second World War, who took great leaps forward both in the concepts behind computing, but also building them. And their work laid the foundation for the development of big computers in the years immediately after the Second World War in the United States, the United Kingdom, and the spread of big mainframe computers through businesses and universities in those decades. The Cold War gave another great boost forward to the computing and internet industry. What we now think of as the internet was created really by the investment of the United States Department of Defense in something they called ARPANET. They wanted a secure communications network that even if nuclear war annihilated everything above ground in the United States, there could still be uh, communication between military commanders. And so the people you see in this photograph here are exactly those kinds of researchers working in the late 1960s on what became the internet. Even 1969, when the Department of Defense started to fund the ARPANET, is a really long time ago. So why is it we're only now talking about digital disruption? Because um, if you look at Google Trends to see when people started talking about it, it wasn't until 2014, it's a really recent idea that digital is disrupting the economy. So why the focus now? Why has it taken so long when we're talking about technologies that are many decades old? Digital technology is an example of a general purpose technology. And here are some examples of others over the centuries. We've got printing, the printing press. We've got the telephone. We've got the steam engine and we've got an electric dynamo. Often general purpose technologies involve communications and energy. And they have certain characteristics. They start with the leading sector, the high tech of its day. And so all of the activity, first of all, starts in one part of the economy. But then they spread very widely and are used very widely across the whole of the economy. So we don't now talk about the electricity economy. We just use electricity everywhere even though it was the high tech of the late 19th and early 20th century. And it'll be the same with digital. We do talk still about the digital economy, but before long, it's going to be everywhere. And it's that spread that explains why the disruption is coming about. A general purpose technology, like digital, isn't just one thing. If you think about the example of electricity, a lot of the basic science dates back to the 19th century. But then other things had to be invented around those insights by the scientists. How to generate electricity, what kinds of standards to use. We have alternating current and distributed current, AC and DC. 
what uh, kind of networks you need to distribute electricity to people's homes and to factories, building the wires to, to build that out, to take uh, electricity to every building, inventing dynamos so that every machine in a factory could be operated on electricity, redoing the buildings. Factories used to be tall, narrow buildings because steam engines were big beasts that ran many machines. With the invention of the dynamo, factories could be spread out flat and the assembly line was a business model innovation that made it possible to manufacture things in a much more efficient way with a, each machine running from its own dynamo. Other goods had to be invented, refrigerators, electric lights, so all of the inventions around a general purpose technology take some time. And you get clusters of technologies and waves. That's what this slide is showing, but digital. The image on the left is the first mouse. Doesn't look much like today's mouses or trackpads, but, um, but it was a key invention. There's a graphical user interface, the metaphor for putting your files on the surface of a, a computer screen or similarly on a smartphone screen. Fibre optic cables, the apps on a smartphone, which depend on algorithms, clever algorithms to work, as well as all the software coding that. And so here on this slide, you can see just a few of all of the many innovations that come together to make up digital technology. The computers in the first place, computer storage, valves and transistors, uh, packet switching, the uh, the process that makes it possible to send messages across the internet, programming language, operating systems, standards like HTML for uh, the World Wide Web, mobile telephony, all the networks, uh, the fibre optic cables, but also the wireless networks that we use now, 3G and 4G and, and increasingly 5G, the application programming interfaces that allow others to build their innovations on top of a platform like a, a smartphone app store. So all of these many, many innovations have to come together. And it takes time. So you get a cluster of innovations and you get waves of innovation. And eventually, something small can happen to make people's behavior and business models change quite significantly. It might be a small thing in itself, but it comes on the back of one of these giant waves of innovation, which has taken many decades to come to fruition. So that's the general purpose technology. Digital is certainly one of these. AI may be another in its early days now. So what is it that's new about digital specifically? Well, we can use the tools of economics to analyse digital technologies. And they have some very distinctive features. All, that all come together to make them so disruptive. There's a lot of innovation, as I've just been describing. And because often the innovation is in software or ideas and not something like building a steel mill or an aircraft manufacturing plant, the pace of innovation has been really rapid. And the spread of many digital innovations, such as mobile phones, has been far faster than the spread of previous waves of technology. There are increasing returns to scale because it often takes a very large amount of money to make the initial investment. It then becomes ever cheaper to produce at a large scale. Now, this isn't a new phenomenon. Lots of old economy industries have very large economies of scale as well. If you think about something like building a steel mill, well, that's a costly investment and you want to then produce as much steel from your one steel mill as you can to make it as efficient as possible. But with digital technologies, those increasing returns to scale are found pretty much everywhere with a special twist. The cost of producing something like an operating system or a piece of software is all up front. You need to pay the programmers to devise it and make it work. And then the marginal cost, the extra cost of selling another unit is almost zero. So it's increasing returns to scale and then some. And these are found throughout the digital economy. There are also what are called network effects. And these are used, uh, taken advantage of in building what we know as multi-sided markets or digital platforms. 
And uh, that's my economic jargon alert. Network effects you hear spoken of a lot when people are talking about digital economics. What that means is that the more people use the technology, the better it is for everybody, including all the people already using it, not just the new users. The telephone network is obviously much more useful the more people there are on the network. With digital platforms, you get those direct network effects and also what are called indirect network effects. So the people on the other side of the platform, if I want to find a restaurant to eat out in, then I want there to be a lot of restaurants um, on, the, on that platform where I'm looking for them. And a restaurant that, want, that is listing on a platform wants there to be lots of potential diners registered on the other side of the platform. And these are the indirect network effects. So these are a kind of externality, but they also mean that um, you've got this sort of amplified economies of scale. Very often platforms struggle to start with and will lose a lot of money in their early days because they don't have enough users or suppliers on one or the other side of the platform. But when they hit the sweet spot, when they hit, hit the critical spot or a tipping point, then um, they, will become, they can become very successful. And so now with digital availability, uh, many, many companies are choosing the digital platform model. So it's a business model innovation as well. What else is special about digital? Well, intellectual property is really important because a lot of the services that are being provided are uh, involve intangibles, uh, such as a special um, app or a piece of software or, or, or data as a particular kind of intellectual, um, intellectual property that is becoming really important in the digital economy. So we've got all of these characteristics. They're not new to economics, we can use economics to analyse them, um, but they come together in a very particular way in the digital economy. So let's think about those in turn. Here I've given you an image of a smartphone. It's mine, so you've got my dog in the background there. She's called Cabbage. Um, but this is a really good example of the way that these technologies uh, come together and you've got the different clusters of innovation needed to make it economically powerful. So here I've put the wireless networks and that's the telephone companies building their mobile networks and upgrading them with every generation of technology, 3G to 4G to 5G, Bluetooth as well. But also around that, um, all of the improvements that have taken place in wireless communications, compressing data so that it, you can get more through the same amount of cable, the, the, the speed of transmission going up, the quality of the transmission increasing, but also innovations like governments auctioning wireless spectrum so that they're used more efficiently and by innovative companies offering mobile services. The smartphones themselves, touchscreen displays, battery life, miniaturization, specialized chips that make smartphones work more effectively, the operating system on the smartphone. So that's two clusters. Then we've got a cluster around the apps on the smartphone, the software, uh, the market design, so innovation in economics itself that underpins how many apps work, and the business model innovation, the digital platforms that I was just mentioning. And then a, a fourth set of uh, clusters, a cluster of innovation around data, GPS, global positioning systems that made apps possible, um, augmented reality being introduced in more and more of them, and also user-generated data. So many apps now don't just take information from elsewhere, but they also use all of the information that their users provide back to the app. So like other uh, aspects of general purpose technologies, you had a cluster of innovation in different areas all coming together, and the launch of the Apple iPhone in June 2007, and of the App Store a year later, brought us this world where we are always on, all of us, everywhere, all the time. And that's the trigger for a lot of what we are now calling the disruption of digital. A long history of innovations in many related areas of technology, but all combining, coalescing to this moment only just over 10 years ago when things really changed quite dramatically. That's the innovation story. 
What about the scale story and the network effect story? So this is Apple's headquarters in Cupertino. It's quite an impressive building, as you can see. And you might have heard of what are sometimes called the GAFA, or the, the, the big digital companies, the big American companies, Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, and also big Chinese companies like Baidu and Tencent. The digital economy has lots of really very large companies indeed. And this is driven partly by those special economies of scale that you want to reach as wide a market as possible once you have invested all of that amount upfront in devising the software and the platform in the first place. With marginal costs close to zero, really you do want the whole world to be your market. And then you get the, these dynamics that I started to describe as well, the tipping points. Many, many platform businesses fail. They never get to that critical point where they can make, make a profit. But once they do, they become really compelling. If you want to be on a social media platform, you want to be on the one that everybody you know is on as well. If you're a small business, you want to be where you know that you're much more likely to attract customers than anywhere else, so you're going to advertise on Facebook. So it's no real surprise that the very big digital, com digital companies are those in um, markets that are themselves very large. They've got a large domestic market. That gives them a head start in taking advantage of these economies of scale. There are also markets where there's a lot of money to be invested in companies that lose a lot for a very long time until they hit that tipping point where they become the winner takes all in the market. So these winner take all characteristics are quite common and this poses a challenge for competition policy, which is an area where a lot of economists have been thinking hard recently about how to make sure that you can have competition in these markets. Because winner takes all isn't how we normally think about competition. The model in the economic textbooks is that there are lots and lots of companies competing at the same time. And it's known as competing in the market. But here are markets, digital markets, where there's one dominant player. This slide shows the amount of time that people in the United Kingdom spend on different internet properties, as they're known. And you'll see that there are two really giant blobs there. It's Google and Facebook, and they dominate these markets. So how can we make sure that competition is possible? If you think back to what's now pretty much digital prehistory, Microsoft with Internet Explorer dominated the browser market. That dominant position got disrupted and now a lot of us would use Chrome or perhaps Safari. Similarly, MySpace used to be the dominant social media platform. It got taken over by Facebook. Facebook is the dominant one now. So in the past, we have seen these examples of a previously dominant digital company being overturned. And that's what we call competition for the market. The market's contestable. Somebody else can get in there. The question now is, could somebody really disrupt Facebook and become a different dominant social media platform? Could somebody really dominate, uh, really, could somebody really disrupt Google and become the dominant search platform, just as it re replaced Yahoo many, many years ago? And the answer is not clear that it's not clear that they could. And so competition authorities around the world are now devising new policies to try to make sure that these markets are remain contestable. Examples of what they might do include stopping the big companies taking over any others in the way that Facebook previously took over WhatsApp and Instagram. They're thinking about could they make it um, a requirement for data to be shared so that new entrants can come into these markets without having to overcome that barrier of not having nearly as much data as the big giants do. But we're still waiting to see. Uh, we don't know yet whether competition for the market can actually occur uh, in, in these digital markets. This is very much exciting and open territory in economics and in economic policy. But I don't need to think that the impact of digital platforms is all bad. This is a new kind of business model really enabled by smartphones and 3G and 4G and 5G, this always-on, all-the-time world that we're in now. There are great benefits to consumers from 
multi-sided platforms. And this slide is illustrating some of them. The top left-hand panel here shows uh, from a paper by Joel Waldvogel the increase in variety in a number of sectors. So it's songs, films, books and TV shows. Increasing variety, particularly in the area of these cultural goods, is really good for consumers. It's very highly valued. We've got such different tastes, we want to watch different things. And so the internet and these platforms have made possible, made accessible, this huge variety that allows um, better matching between what people actually want and what's available. And so on the top right hand side here, you've got uh, an illustration of one of the matching algorithms that lies behind the market design underpinning some of the apps. And this is something that works for Netflix, for uh, um, Uber, if you're trying to find a ride, for restaurants. Matching platforms uh, create uh, positive benefits for the consumers, but also actually for the suppliers, the producers in these markets, because if you're producing a niche product, you're, the market that you can reach becomes much, much larger if you can do so through one of these platforms. So the benefits of scale and the benefits of matching can be large for everybody. Potentially, everybody gains from them. The image at the bottom is Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, who famously uh, identified this niche, that uh, this possibility that niche products uh, could be traded, that the transactions could take place that never would have in the past without the platform of eBay. But with eBay, people could uh, supply things uh, that were a mi real minority taste and people who had those uh, niche tastes would be able to access them. So this is, all, this is all great. People really value these digital platforms. In work that I've been doing, the value that uh, people place on some of them is just as high as the value that's placed on uh, goods such as being able to go to the park or being able to watch TV. But there is a catch. They are, in fact, disruptive. Uber is a great example of the upsides and the downsides of this kind of disruption. Obviously, for people who want to find a taxi ride, this is fantastic. Many of us now use Uber. You can um, find your ride uh, in the place that you want, at the time that you want, and without having to wait for very long. It's also, as we know, uh, often less costly than getting a taxi, and that's one of the controversial aspects of what Uber offers. It's also, as this image shows you, really bad for incumbent taxi drivers. Here's one of the many strikes that took place when Uber started entering European markets. Taxi drivers who were already in the market lost out. That's really bad for them. Many of them have seen their incomes decline. Is that a good thing or a bad thing for the economy as a whole? Well, a lot of taxis had monopolies of local markets. And that was partly to make sure that safety standards were enforced, that the drivers have insurance, that they don't uh, rip off the customers by overcharging, setting regulated rates. The downside is that they were local monopolies. And very often in many cities, you'd find there were taxi shortages and you'd have to wait a long time to get one. So, for example, New York City, when Uber entered the market, had the same number of taxi licenses as it had had in the 1930s, even though the city had grown very much larger. So there are distributional effects, and there are also obviously some pros and cons for the economy as a whole. But the reason platform models such as Uber have become so controversial is because they make up what's been called the gig economy. On this slide, I'm showing you a result uh, of a survey looking at which kinds of workers really have flexibility in their jobs. One of the advantages of the gig economy is that the people who work in it uh, can work part time easily. People who don't have a very strong attachment to the workplace, perhaps they find it hard to get jobs because of having children or because they are from immigrant communities. They find it easier to get a pathway through one of these platforms than through a conventional job. And the flexibility is often uh, described as one of the advantages for workers. But what this slide shows you is that the workers get to choose the hours, the higher paid they are. So if you're in a high pay category, you're more likely to be able to choose your hours of work than your employer is. If you're in a low pay category, 
then your employer is much more likely to choose your hours of work. The flexibility is one-sided on their side. Combine that with the fact that um, the, the average pay rates don't uh, reach the minimum wage level, and there are other questions about the treatment of workers, then you understand why the gig economy has become quite controversial. Great for consumers, but has that come at the expense of the workers, the drivers in this example? So the model puts the risk on the employees, and that's a big downside because many of us are consumers, but many of us are workers too, so this matters to us. Questions like how do you ensure that people get the minimum wage, that they don't work too many hours? What about a pension? If you're in a conventional job, your employer in this country now has to sign you into a pension scheme. What about equipment? Are you going to have to provide all that yourself? Because if so, individuals have much less capacity to pay for it than companies do. Well, what about training? Are you going to invest in your own training if you're on um, low pay in a gig, em a gig employment environment? What about tax? If you're self-employed through a platform, you're quite likely not to reach the threshold for VAT, value-added tax, and so the economy's tax base is being eroded by the model. So it's quite complicated figuring out whether some of these digital platforms are a plus or a minus for the economy as a whole. And there have, of course, been lots of court cases, uh, most recently one that found against Uber and has required it to start making sure that its drivers do get minimum wage. This isn't just digital, this is about enforcing labour market regulations. In some recent work that I've done with colleagues in Oxford, we found that about a quarter of the UK workforce is either solo self-employed, on zero hours contracts, or fixed term, short term contracts. So this sort of gig model is really quite widespread, and it's because of labour market regulation not being enforced. But it's been easier for digital platforms or some digital platforms to operate in this way. So it's one of the downsides of the digital economy. There's also another aspect of the disruption of work. If you're somebody who's got the skills to work with the machines, then digital disruption has been good for you. There's some very high paying jobs and these kinds of jobs have been growing in number. There've also been a lot of people in uh, jobs at the other end of the skills and pay spectrum, people who don't have so many formal academic qualifications and are in low paid jobs, but they are hard to substitute by machines, things like uh, cleaning, and so uh, there have been lots of jobs created there. The middle of the work, work, workforce in terms of skills and pay has been hollowed out. This isn't just affecting pay and jobs, though. It's also affecting location. And what this chart is showing you is work by an American economist, David Ortor from MIT. And it shows uh, in 1970, 1990 and 2015, the pattern of employment at different levels of skill and different sizes of city. So on the vertical axis, we've got employment share. On the horizontal axis, axis we've got size of city. And um, we're, sh we're seeing the shifts over time in high-skilled jobs, which need a college degree, and they're the blue ones, and low-skilled jobs that you can do without having the equivalent of A-levels. And you see the picture changes really quite dramatically over time, over the decades. It used to be the case that the highest proportion of jobs were these lower skill jobs in terms of academic qualifications. Um, but there were somewhat fewer of those in large cities. And on the other hand, a smaller share of jobs in high skilled uh, occupations, but increasing with city size. So more of those in the bigger cities. These two lines have uh, moved together and then crossed each other over time. And so now there are more high skill jobs concentrated in large cities and uh, more low skill jobs in smaller places. So as well as the polarisation in terms of skill and pay, we've seen a polarisation in terms of place as well. And so in many countries, these are for the United States, but in other European countries in the UK, we have seen this polarisation in terms of place. The left behind places, it's called in the political debate. 
And these trends are being driven by fundamental shifts in technology. So it's very hard for governments to know what to do about them. And the solution that's often given, which is education, uh, give more and more people the skills needed to work with di digital technologies is surely part of the answer, but it's a slow uh, impact policy and we haven't seen much effect of that yet on the labour market. So that's disruption in terms of the jobs market. There's even disruption in terms of how do we measure the economy. Here I'm showing you the evolution of mobile phones from the early 1990s to recent smartphones with um, uh, user-generated apps like Waze, a mapping app, where part of the information comes from people who are using the app almost instantaneously. So my question to you is, are these all phones? Obviously, in the early 1990s, we made voice calls, and that was that. When you got a smartphone, you could start, well, in between, you could start texting, then we got the smartphone with the apps. So now you can make voice calls, do texts and use some apps. And then we added the information that came from elsewhere, like the global positioning systems that gave us the map. And then we added the user generated content. And in between, all kinds of different things have been packed into our phones. They're a diary, a road atlas, a watch, a camera, a calculator, a radio. So when we measure the price now of whatever this is, what is it a price of? It isn't really a price of a phone the way that a price of a 1990s mobile phone would have been. Well, you might ask, why does this matter? And the reason is that to calculate the real growth of the economy or the real productivity of the economy, we want to use a price index. So we want to have a price uh, that measures the change in, in price of, of something held constant over time. And here we have a device whose quality and characteristics have changed so profoundly over time, it's not obvious that it's the same thing. This might seem a bit academic, but I did a piece of work with some colleagues that looked at the price of telecommunications services, the services that you get through your smartphone. So I looked at, with some colleagues at the price of telecommunications services, the services that you get through your iPhone when you pay for your SIM card or your plan. And we improved this price index partly by taking account of the fact that you're getting so much more through this device than you would have done five or ten years ago. And we found, as the slide shows you, that rather than a price that was flat for several years, the price declined really quite substantially by more than a third. And when you translate this through into how do you calculate the real growth rate of the economy, which is what the right-hand panel of the, of the uh, slide shows you, it added 0.16 percentage points to GDP growth. It doesn't sound a lot, but GDP growth has been quite low. And this is just one service that's affected by digital. So potentially, there are lots more of these. Now, I don't think this is why growth in the economy is slow or why productivity has been flat. But unless you start to understand these dynamics and what it is that we're measuring, it's quite hard to understand what is driving growth in the economy. And intangibles matter a lot in the digital economy. I wrote my first book about digital economics in 1997, The Weightless World, and the increase in GDP in the previous decade had literally had no maths. If you measured the mass of GDP, that was no higher in 1997 than it had been a decade or so earlier. And that's true again now. We've had a lot more growth in the real economy since then, in real terms, but the mass of GDP has not gone up. If anything, it's been going down. So all of that extra economic value that we've been creating, it's intangible. And that's quite a hard thing to get your head around. We're paying more for bits, not for atoms. And there are some real puzzles being thrown up by this. Here's an example that you might remember. This is an ape which took its own photograph. This is a selfie. A photographer had set up a camera uh, in the forest where these apes lived and they came up and they triggered the camera and took lovely smiling pictures of themselves. This photograph became the subject of a couple of court cases. A lot of people around the world were very taken by this obviously and used the image 
the photographer claimed that he had intellectual property rights and that people not paying royalties for using the image were depriving him of his income. He didn't win the case. Peter, the animal charity, brought a case on behalf of the ape and said it was the ape's intellectual property and they should be getting the money. And they didn't win that either. So here's an example where this isn't anybody's property, but there are lots of intangible items in which people are claiming property rights. So, for example, John Deere makes tractors, General Motors make cars, and they sell those tractors and cars to people who are used to the idea that they can get them fixed if they break down. There's now so much software, though, flowing into the vehicles in real time to give the farmers information about soil and moisture levels or to give the drivers information about road conditions and accidents that the companies are claiming that the purchasers don't own the vehicles. They are just, if you like, renting them because there's so much intellectual property, intangible property in these vehicles that, they, that the ownership in that is retained by the companies themselves. Another example is people who bought eBooks on Amazon found that those eBooks had been deleted, even though, as far as they were concerned, they had paid for a permanent purchase of property rights and it was their book. Amazon disagreed. There are more and more of these cases and it suggests that the intellectual property framework that we have to incentivize innovation and creation somehow isn't working as it needs to for the digital economy. Another example of a really special kind of intellectual property is data. You will often heard it said that data is the new oil. It's not really, it's got completely the opposite characteristics. If I burn oil Nobody else can do so in their car or their um, electricity generating station. But if I use some data, there's nothing to stop you using the same data. The oil is rival and the data is non-rival in consumption. But what is true is that data is being used throughout the economy more and more. And the most successful companies are those using data the most effectively. But data is not only non-rival, so in principle any of us could use it, there are lots of externalities involved as well. One obvious one is privacy. If I uh, post a photograph of you, perhaps that's invading your privacy in some way, even if it's my photograph. Almost all data involves relationships, so it isn't obvious what the implications are for privacy or indeed for ownership of that property. There are also many possibilities. We could combine data in um, new ways to develop new products, new innovations. A great example would be an app like City Mapper, which takes data from all kinds of transport providers, from map providers, and uh, makes it much easier for us to get around uh, cities, saving lots of time, stopping us getting lost, and so on. The, there's a trade-off often between these. We want to be able to enable data sharing for more innovation, things that will serve us really well, but also we want to protect privacy and security. So at the bottom of this slide, there's a result from a new paper looking at the impact of GDPR, General Data Protection Reg uh, Regulation, on um, innovation in apps, in the App Store. And you can see the large drop-off in the creation of new apps once GDPR had come into force. So by protecting privacy in this very rigorous way, which a lot of um, Europeans are very proud of because it's setting a standard for privacy around the globe, it's actually potentially stopping some innovation that might serve as well. So all of these implications of intellectual property, intangibles, the data economy, it's a, a really wide open frontier in economic research. This is something that is now disrupting the economy. The special characteristics of digital technologies have got us to the point where this disruption is quite widespread. But there's a lot to think about and understand and a lot of really exciting research going on in this area. So I hope this has inspired some of you to think about carrying on with your economic studies and uh, in particular focusing on digital and, and joining me in some of this very exciting research. We've got a lot of questions to answer and actually a lot at stake because the potential for digital to make people's lives better is large. 
the technology is still moving really rapidly. Uh, the public policy questions are wide open. Um, we've got to get this right. We've got to make this work for all of us. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, there's one more slide which will advertise my recent books to you. And um, I hope you've enjoyed this. And I hope to see in a few years' time a lot more fantastic research on the digital economy coming from all of you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Diane, for such a fascinating talk. Um, that spans so many areas from the impact of the economy on workers' rights, the location of people in more or less deprived areas, issues around competition policy, issues around innovation in itself and its disruptiveness. That was absolutely fantastic. And as you might expect, questions have just been flooding in on a variety of the topics that you you touched on, and I will try and kind of group some of them together. But to the audience, we have plenty of time for questions. The session doesn't end till 1430. So we have a good 25 minutes for questions. So Diane, I think there's a whole set of questions that have come in about job insecurity in the gig economy. And a number of people have noted, first of all, that job insecurity in the gig economy fuels political discontent. Uh, discontent. Um, and that leads to the question about, is there room for a more generous social security safety net policies, given the rise in the gig economy? Um, and also other policies, Somebody else asked about, you know, do you need actually to have a living wage in place in order to run a successful gig economy in which you are not harming producers? So I wondered if you could first of all think about those kind of the interface between social security policies and the gig economy and, and speculate on where you think policies may be needed and what we might do to change our policies. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Carol, and hello, everybody. And um, here we are all in cyberspace for this year's uh, lecture and discussion. Um, so we need this digital stuff uh, and have needed it more than ever in the past 15 months or so. Those are all great questions, and there are a lot of issues bundled up in those. The digital platforms clearly make it easier for gig employment to happen because that is their model. Um, but the first thing I'd want to point out is that it's not just in the digital economy that people work with, with these kinds of contingent arrangements or um, insecure arrangements. It's much more, more widespread than people imagine. And so, for example, in a hairdressing salon, some of the people there will be solo self-employed people. In the hospitality industry, taxi drivers working for your local minicab company, not just Uber. And so what's happening is an interaction between um, the digital business model, which is spreading to areas like hospitality or um, all the um, tasks that we used to find somebody local to do for us, um, the platforms now provide. But it's the interaction between that and um, a lack of enforcement of labor market protections across the board. So we do, for example, have a minimum wage, but it hasn't been enforced effectively on these platforms. And there have now been a number of court cases that have found all the same way that workers do have the right to receive the minimum wage, and it's the enforcement that's now needed. Having said that, I do think there are changes that we should be thinking about to the way that we structure um, social security and pensions. Because for a very long time, the model has, has been that government policies are delivered largely through people having jobs with employers. And that doesn't fit with a model of flexibility. I would be very surprised if we revert to a model of the old fashioned model of people sticking with um, one job, one employer fixed hours, because um, most people find great value in that kind of flexibility. For example, if you're a parent with young children, there's an obvious advantage in that. And what we, what we need to get is the right balance between um, protection and enabling people to have those opportunities to work in, in different ways. So I don't think the answers here are easy, 
um, saying that we should be enforcing minimum protections and minimum wage is quite straightforward. And that needs the government to put resources into the inspectorates that do that and uh, stop workers having to go to court to enforce their rights. But I think we need to give more thought to how you design a social security system that um, serves people as individuals working in non-standard ways. And actually, after the experience we've had in the past year, I think there's going to be more of that and not less of that. So it's become more urgent to try and think about designing a more flexible social security system to go with the more flexible patterns that people want in their lives. Can I ask a, a kind of follow up to that is how much if one country does that and nobody else does that, is, is this a problem, do you think, given the, the international nature of the gig economy in some ways? I don't, um, I don't know that it is a problem. There are not so many areas of the gig economy where there's competition from international workers. And that's because a lot of it is serving those um, services where they're, they're location based. Um, so the hairdressers or the drivers have to be in the place where people want to use the service. There's relatively few um, which are services delivered online. I mean, of course, there are some. If you want um, data visualization done for cheap or software written, then you would look to Eastern Europe to get very skilled programmers at a lower cost than um, doing so in the UK. But having said that, there are lots and lots of um, jobs for people with those kinds of skills in the UK as well. They're, they're not the problem. And um, so in that area, I don't think international competition is an issue. The really big problem uh, in terms of international competition is tax. And it looks like there is progress on getting international agreement about making uh, big companies, in including big digital companies, uh, pay their share of the tax burden, which has, as I said in the talk, been eroded uh, in a number of ways over time. I think we might come back to the issue of tax since it's very live, but I'd like to take some, uh, some of the questions from the audience, which is um, uh, a mature student at Anglia Ruskin University asks, has digital disruption not aided and abetted the casino economics of one winner, a few minor winners and a vast array of losers in an era of freedom of choice, so long as it's the winner's vanilla? A very complex question, I think, raising a number of issues, but I wondered if you had thoughts on this issue of the one winner produces vanilla, essentially. Well, you know, as I was explaining, there is very clearly this winner-takes-all phenomenon, and that's something that around the world competition authorities are trying to uh, tackle to make sure that uh, if somebody has a better product, they can, they can get into that market. I don't know if I think those services provided by Google or Facebook are particularly vanilla. Um, and, and in fact, you might argue that digital is better at serving people's individual preferences. And if you look at areas, the cultural areas I was referring to, actually they're the opposite of vanilla. There's an absolute rainbow kaleidoscope of things that you can access now that was not previously possible. The one area where um, I might agree with the spirit of the question is finance actually, and the way that digital has enabled the growth of global financial markets and the arms race there in terms of speed and the um, uh, what you can call the casino, the speculation that takes place in financial markets. We wouldn't have the financial markets we do without digital technology, that's very clear. And I think that's the area where the societal harm from these technologies is clearest. But having said that, there's progress now in, at least in the UK, in trying to bring uh, competition into those markets in a way that serves consumers through open banking. And the idea of open banking is that uh, there are very few high street banks. They know a lot about us and um, this gives them a sort of data advantage, but they are now being required to open um, through API application programming interfaces to newcomers in technology markets who can 
use that data in secure ways to provide services that will bring benefits to consumers and, and more choice and, and more competition. Um, not clear how effectively that's going to work in the long term, but it's a great experiment. The other thing I'd say about the winner take all effects is that I talked about them as if they were inherent and to some degree they are, but to some degree they're coded in by the technology. If you think about sending a text message on your phone, it doesn't matter what handset you have or which network you're on, that's completely interoperable. That could be true or more true of some of the digital services as well. So instant messaging between different apps could equally be made more interoperable than it is. And I think that's another interesting area, both data sharing and interoperability um, interesting ways to think about reducing that winner takes all advantage. I wonder, thank you, and I wonder that that kind of relates to issues around whether um, what what you think competition authorities should be focusing on first here, Diane. They usually they have a huge list that you outlined some of. If you had to answer the question, as a competition authority, where would you put your resources first? Where would you go? I think I'd start with the access to data point and um, requiring some kind of secure interoperable access for newcomers to the market. Because um, I was on a, the panel chaired by Jason Furman that looked at competition in, in digital markets and when we spoke to small companies trying to grow or people trying to get into digital markets, this was probably one of the things that was most at the forefront of their minds. And often they said GDPR, the data protection regulation had, had made it harder for them because they were trying to compete against giant companies with lots of money and very large stores of data that they had already. So I, I might start there. Um, and that's partly because it's very complex. There are lots of security and privacy issues about that. The technological issues are not straightforward. Um, but it's partly to allow entry and it's partly so that competition authorities can monitor what's happening in digital markets. There's quite a lot of debate in the literature now about whether algorithms can collude with each other. And um, just by observing um, what other algorithms are doing. And so is it possible that they end up by responding to each other's behavior, they end up charging prices to consumers that are higher than they would be in a competitive market with no intent on the part of the companies operating them to do this, but could that happen? And so even to monitor whether that's happening, the competition authorities will need some data access. So I would start with the data questions. Um, having said that, I think scrutinizing takeovers um, would be a really very straightforward place to start. These giant companies take over another company, you know, once every two or three weeks. There are very, very many of them and very few of them have been called in by competition authorities. So that's another more straightforward lever to use in these markets. But we might find out that neither of these work actually. And then we'll have to think about much more interventionist approaches. Some people have suggested breaking up the companies that damages the value to consumers. So I'm less keen on that, but that's an option. And another suggestion is that they're treated like um, an electricity utility or the water company. And there is much, much greater regulatory intervention in what services they provide and what prices they charge to people. And so I think we ought as you know, governments and regulators to keep those possibilities in our back pocket in case actually it's not possible to improve competition in these markets. I think that's that, thank you. And that relates very much to a question that I'd ask a couple that kind of go together, which is one a sort of follow up question that one of the audience member has posed is, what are the implications for society of the way that digital disruptors are regulated? And the, the person is saying they're thinking about Facebook's oversight board and Donald Trump. And then related to that is a kind of pushing it a little further. 
which is a comment that Luddites opposed the Industrial Revolution, the Amish rejected mechanization. Some users are now coming off Facebook. Do you foresee a rebellion to digital technology emerging? So the kind of questions about what the firms are doing and what the consumers might be doing in a kind of extreme way. Yeah. Well, um, these are questions on which any of us can have opinions. I think that they're moving away from the straightforward economics, aren't they? I mean, it's clear that part of the harms to society that have been caused by some of the platforms um, do include uh, threats to democracy, um, conspiracy theories, and um, you know, calling people online and so on. So, so there are very large harms that have been brought about by them. And should we be leaving the regulation of that to the companies themselves? And many people would be uncomfortable with that idea. And yet, on the other hand, they're, they're private companies, and um, there there should be scope for them to decide what they will and and will not do. So this is difficult territory, and obviously there's a huge debate going on about this at the moment and I don't have any special insight into what the right answer is about those. Of course we can all stop using them in some ways so we can leave one particular um, social media platform. I'm not on Facebook but then I miss out on a lot of things that my friends and family post because they all are so that's part of the choice that you make. And we can't give them up entirely can we? We'd have had no social life in the past year if we'd not been using some online platforms. The, the regulatory question there, I think, is what are called dark patterns and the ways that the interfaces are designed to make them addictive or to nudge people using behavioral psychology to do particular things. And um, this is an area where lots of technologists are working to try to understand, to monitor better what's going on and um, to think about whether there are, if you like, technological speed bumps that can be inserted or um, uh, regulatory interventions that could be proposed to stop that sort of manipulation. But in a way, that's part of the journey of the capitalist economy, isn't it? I mean, it started with um, Mad Men and Madison Avenue in the, in the post-war years. And there's a constant arms race between regulators thinking about the public good and uh, advertisers trying to sell things. Thank you. Um, and there are a couple of questions about kind of households that have come up, which is the first is, are households relative, and this relates to your work on, on valuing intangibles. The first one is, are households relatively poorer? Because instead of one family and one TV, and a landline, they now all need to buy devices and data, subscribe to streaming services, lease content, or are they just, in your view, converting permanent tangibles into temporary intangibles? So that's kind of one question about household consumption. Then there's another question about household production, which is, do you think essentially the digital economy will really shift, and you hinted at this, really shift the distribution um, of resources between cities and obviously communities in those cities, and what might we need to do about that? They're both big questions. Um, I don't think we have a clear enough idea about the impact of um, the shift in consumption patterns and what people are paying for things on the economic welfare of households. Um, some of what people are paying for is obviously captured in uh, the price indices that are created by statistical offices like the Office of National Statistics. And so if we pay for our data plan, that goes in there and its weight in the inflation index depends on um, how much of our expenditure goes on that, what share goes on that. So some of it's being captured. But as I hinted, I'm not sure that all of it is because there are lots of substitutions going on from things that we used to buy um, to this data and device package that we all have now. And I'm not sure I can answer the question 
is a typical household now better or worse off because um, stop buying clocks and watches and roadmaps and cameras and radios and all of that and have this device and data package instead. There's also a question about, um, I think about lower income households where, you know, clearly this is quite a large part of um, people's expenditure and it has become a necessity. And we generally worry quite a lot about things that people have to buy, um, such as electricity or food. And that those necessities have a higher share in the um, expenditure of, of families, households on, on lower incomes. So I think there's a lot to that we still need to understand. And you could throw in all kinds of other phenomena as well. For example, apps that make it easy for people to pass on things they stopped using to other people, which should become very widespread. So it's not even that there's more secondhand sales than there used to be. There's lots of free stuff available. And you don't have to be on a low income to use those services. It's, um, you know, it's environmentally um, sustainable as well. So that's very complicated and I don't think I know the answer at all to that. On parcel production, um, I thought you were going to go somewhere else with the question, Carol, because um, one of the things that's happening is that we are doing things for ourselves in our household that we used to go to somebody in the market economy to do, banking, um, going to a travel agent. So there are lots of things that we do online there are things that you can get online for free. So a lot of economists now don't purchase software, they download free software, R or Python, and that kind of substitution is taking place. So in the way that um, a lot of women went out of the household production uh, part of the economy in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, and started getting paid employment and buying, refrigerators and ready meals and paying people for childcare, which added to the market side of the economy, which gets counted in GDP. Now there's a substitution going the other way out of the marketed economy into the household. And um, there's not uh, enough uh, data to figure out exactly how, that, how much of that has happened, how big that shift has been and how you might value it yet. Although I think we'll get there but it's potentially quite a, quite a big phenomenon. Um, and I've now forgotten what the other part of the question was, I'm sorry. It was, it was about how will digital shifts to working at home uh, impact on factors like employers, employee skill distribution, housing, infrastructure investment, and tax takes in cities. So it's kind of pushing that a little bit from, from onwards from just the individual to the collective, really, the distribution of these skills in particular areas? Well, until last March, I would have said very clearly um, that digital technologies were paradoxically making us cluster together more because they are a complement for face-to-face -face interactions. And the more people could connect online, the more they wanted to meet up. And that was part of the phenomenon driving um, uh, the agglomeration economies, um, as economists call them. And so I showed you that charts from David Alter's fantastic paper um, where highly skilled people were increasingly concentrated in the densest cities and that meant that um, there were more concentrations of lower skilled lower paid people and when I say skilled I mean academic qualifications that's how it gets measured um, in in smaller towns or uh, in rural areas. Of course this is an open question now because we don't know how much the working from home pattern is going to stick after um, things can potentially get back to normal, quotes normal. And um, there, uh, so I think it's just really hard to predict what infrastructure investment will be needed, um, what transport connections will be needed and how people are going to organize their working lives. I'm a bit of a skeptic that we will all stick with working from home. I think that power of exchanging ideas face to face, um, the flashes of inspiration you get from connections with other people is actually very important for um, the kind of high cognitive skill jobs that are associated with digital technology. Thank you. And there's a kind of clutch of questions really about the economics of developing things. 
in the new technology. So one um, question is about, the questioner noted that Apple's new iOS update launches the tracking transparency feature that puts users in control of cross apps, cross site tracking and the services they use. Yet this data is absolutely essential to the business model of the com companies such as Facebook. So how can we use economics to grapple with, or what will economics tell us, I think, about these kind of innovations that are taking place within the, the digital economy itself? I think I'm with the people who see um, uh, Apple's decision to, as, as part of their rivalry against the big digital companies that rely on advertising revenues, so particularly Google and Facebook. And um, it clearly will um, please people who, who take the privacy concerns about not being tracked um, uh, most seriously but it gives Apple a competitive advantage in that um, context as well. The, one of the things that worries me the most about the digital giants is the dependence on advertising revenues actually. And it seems to me it has been degrading the service of, for example, Google and Amazon in their search results because um, selling advertising and promoting the uh, companies who have paid for advertising has become so important. So if you do a Google search for something, the main part of the, of the first screen will be paid for content in some way, advertised content in some way. We ought in a competitive market to be able to see that as an opportunity for somebody to come in with a better product. Um, but I would really like to see actually different kinds of business models too. And there are some um, that offer a subscription alternative rather than advertising. But it feels to me kind of unhealthy that we have ended up with a very large part of the economy and essential services depending on selling advertising because of the incentives that gives them to get people to click on things. And that is driving um, the uh, the search for co viral content, the things that will make people click. And I think actually encouraging things like um, conspiracy theories or, or, or disinformation campaigns. So the business model as a whole worries me. The digital advertising market is very complex, very non-transparent and increasingly concentrated. And for this reason, it's one of the areas that the Competition and Markets Authority picked on first in um, its scrutiny, closer scrutiny of, of digital markets. Yes, I think we're becoming more and more aware of that. And that, that relates to a couple of questions again about the business model, which was, and I think they're related, digital's promise was for a disintermediated frictionless business, but instead middlemen platforms are, are winning over either the consumer or the employee carving out substantial profits and why is why has the promised not matched the reality and and that relates to a kind of comment that came in very very early on which was the number of self-published books has increased but the average value provided to the creator the author is falling what's the rationale for that does amazon for example just use books as a lost leader because it's really interested in something else so I think this is a, these are the questions about the, the kind of model uh, of, of digital economy. You've already talked about advertising. Is there anything you want to kind of add to that, Diane? The Amazon example is really interesting because for a very long time, it made almost no profit. It plowed almost all of it back into, into the business and um, in extending the kinds of business it did over time. And so for example, Amazon Web Services, is a, a less high profile part of Amazon, but it's an incredibly important part of the business now. But, but for years and years, it didn't take profits out. And it's often um, alleged that um, investors are willing to sustain losses in you know, a, a platform such as Uber for a very long time because they do it in anticipation of monopoly power later on. And clearly they will, they will expect a return on their investment at that some stage. Um, um, so where am I going with this? 
so one thing I think I'd say is that we shouldn't have our view about the digital platform model entirely shaped by the big companies. There are lots of platforms that provide uh, exactly the kind of um, a positive fun game for everybody that I was trying to describe, that um, consumers get more choice and, and better prices, that suppliers get to a wider market and can make money, and that there is indeed um, a, seg a segment of, of the surplus for the platform itself for providing the service, but it's not unreasonable. And so platforms are, they're, they're widespread and lots of them provide great services. The issue is all about the big ones and the effectiveness of competition for the big ones and, and, and their behavior. And so in the recommendations that the Competition and Markets Authority here is putting in, into practice, um, they will designate a handful of companies as the ones they're specially interested in because they have that market power, but also because there are things about their behavior that have given rise to some concern. And, um, you know, so I hope, I hope that focus will help address the issues that clearly concern everybody who's, who's um, interested in this and, and debating this. I have to say as an author, you don't, you didn't ever as a typical author make any money from books. So you don't go into it expecting to make your living out of writing books. Very few people are lucky enough to be able to do so. Unless of course you write a best-selling economics textbook, <laughs> in which case you make a lot of money. Um, <laughs> um, I think this, this, there's a kind of kind of quest, couple of questions that sort of open out the, the issues of, of digital. And one is, would you be able to comment on how disruption of the digital economy seems to be taking a different course in developing countries? Uh, and the questioner Sue Rippon asks about, say, for those in Africa. Um, I think we might take that that and that relates to another question which is which is kind of digital is clearly really important but how do we put a control valve in to mean that other industries say physical manufacturing also receive the focus they need and that digital continues to complement our society and doesn't overrun it so i think these are both questions about kind of the role of digital in the economy and what you think on that in different contexts, obviously. I'm no expert on developing countries. Um, I mean, clearly uh, the mobile phone revolution um, was the, the start of ensuring that many people in low income countries had access to digital services. And um, Facebook, for example, through a service called Facebook Zero has made it possible for many people to access Facebook, and it has become a really important platform for entrepreneurship. Um, people in government, public officials in developing countries are concerned just as much as we are about the market power of big companies, whether it's the American ones or, or the Chinese ones. Um, and they're in, you know, arguably a weaker position when it comes to having any negotiating power vis-a-vis -vis the big companies. Um, so there are some complicated questions there. And I think one um, particular issue highlighted in a way by the vaccine debate is about intellectual property. Because the um, every country is a source of that raw material, that data. And so thinking about intellectual property rights is probably a key issue if you're um, in government in a low income country. Um, but I don't want to go too far outside um, my expertise. So let me come to this question about um, the, the control, the control valve, and how do we make sure it works for us, um, and, and and doesn't distort the economy was was the meaning I took from that. And I'm not sure how to go about answering it because it's spreading everywhere. There are lo lots of manufacturing sectors now where digitalization is transforming where they get their value from. And the material stuff, and actually this is what my first book was about in a way, the material stuff is a smaller share of the value and it's the services enabled by digital around that that create value for companies. So I think the distinction between manufacturing and service activities or digital is actually becoming not very useful. It um, diverts our attention from what's going on. 
if you think about a big company such as Rolls Royce, one of our major manufacturers, they sell an awful lot of services, um, monitoring engines performance in real time and diagnosing problems, for example, and that's becoming quite common. And you'll have heard of the Internet of Things, that's about data and digital spreading throughout industry. So I think we need to understand a lot more about what's going on. I'm um, interested at the moment in thinking about construction and infrastructure and how digital is changing the value chains in that and how we will measure the prices of, of different parts of that. Um, but we ought to be thinking about this across um, uh, you know, whole swathes of the economy. And rather than thinking about a digital sector and a manufacturing sector and other things, um, think about how digital is transforming everything. Thank you. Well, we're, we're getting towards the end of our time, but we have, I think it's time for at least one more question, which is returning to this issue of data and ownership of data that you talked about, which then the question is, what impact would consumers' personal data becoming wholly monetized by them have instead of the current model where the data is owned by the digital companies? I think that's a very economics question. Uh, what are your views on it? Well, there, there are a lot of advocates for the idea that the big companies should pay us for our data. The catch is that the marginal value of your data is really low. And there are online calculators, and I plugged mine in, my information in, and the value is something like 26 cents. And the, there is extra value gained from um, combining all that data. Because what a company like Amazon wants to do is understand not what you do, but what people like you do to sell marketing analytics services to, um, to people who are selling things through its platform. And so it's that aggregated information that creates the value. And how through um, what's called a data as labor model, where you get paid as if it were a wage, how do you make sure that, that um, additional spillover value gets shared between people? And for me, the framing of it as an individual transaction is, is the wrong way to think about it. And um, it's a two way thing, data is relational. I don't think it's property. I don't think the metaphor of property serves as well here at all. And um, any information that I post can contain information about somebody else. Um, or if I sh spend money to shop on a card, it's clearly information about me, but it's why is it not the shop's information as well? It's, it's a relational thing. And I would like us to think more about terms of access. Who can get access to what data and what, what are they allowed to use it for? And can we put in place the the technical means and the security that's needed to safeguard that um, so that it opens up more possibilities for the use of data so that we will benefit from it but not directly from being paid 26 cents. Thank you and I think I have one more kind of economics question which is well there, there are all sorts of things that have come in that I haven't had time to expand upon but What's your view on the digital economy impacting on macro variables, particularly inflation? Gosh, um, that's not an easy one on which to end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my sense is that inflation is lower than um, we currently measure it to be because of the technological changes. There are a lot of digitally enabled changes in all kinds of goods and services that are not accounted for at the moment. But having said that, the distributional questions worry me greatly because what's the benefit of um, huge technological improvements in certain kinds of products that only well-off people are purchasing? So I think there's also more dispersion of the impact inflation, different prices on different kinds of people. And so that's not a macroeconomic issue um, but it's a really important public policy issue. I'm going to evade the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, you, you've answered a huge range of questions, partly because your own talk raised a huge, was incredibly magisterial and 
crossed a, a huge number of areas and there have been several comments that have come in that this was an absolute wonderful lecture for a layman and, and very many thanks to you. So I think, you know, with the remaining kind of minute that we have, I'd really like you to thank you, Diane, for such a stimulating talk and for answering questions for over 25, well, 35 minutes. Uh, on such a wide ranging topic. I hope everybody has very much enjoyed this. And in the, the remaining minute that I have, I'd like to thank everybody that's made this possible. Of course, Diane. Secondly, uh, the University of York for hosting the webinar and both the University of York and the University of Reading for co-hosting this with the RES. We are all just sorry that we couldn't be with you in person and see you in person and hear from you in person. And we'd like to thank them for all their contributions over the past year in making the event a success. I'd finally like to thank Georgina and the rest of the operations team at the Royal Economic Society uh, for all their work in making this happen. There's a lot of work that goes into these activities and it's all been seamless and wonderful, apart from the fact that we couldn't see you all. So finally, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for taking part and for your fabulous questions and indeed your interest in economics. So I encourage you to become economists, stay with economics and just think about how brilliant economics is in, as illustrated by Diane's talk. So thank you very much to everybody and goodbye.